Okay, class, this is for Friday, September 18th, and this should not be a long session of notes here. We're going to do a little bit of review. That's very typical of what I would normally do. I like to review the notes that we took yesterday, make sure you understand them, and then give you some new ones. Now, honestly, as we move into next week, and especially in the next unit, I'm going to give way more notes than I'm giving right now. But starting off, kind of easing you into this, we're not going to have that many notes uh, to take. So the last time we took notes on Thursday, we talked about economic basics. So you should have all of these notes already. This should not be new to you. We talked about a market economy. We talked about a command economy. We talked about mixed economies. And we talked about traditional economies. So the United States is primarily a market economy. If you come up with a really cool idea and that really cool idea catches on, uh, then you get rich. I mean, you thought of the idea. You took the risk. Um, somebody in class makes a really cool phone cover uh, that everybody just absolutely falls in love with. It's adorable. Uh, and you start making them like out of your basement or something. Hey, if it takes off, it takes off and you get rich. There's a lot of success stories like that. For every success story, there's about 99 failure stories where somebody's like, oh, I have this great idea for this product. And the product is just kind of weird and it it doesn't really appeal to a lot of people. Same deal. You get to invest all your money in that and then you lose all your money and you find out it wasn't that great of an idea. You get to take the risk in a market economy. The United States is primarily a market economy. Um, Great Britain, France, primarily market economies. Command economy. This is where the government makes decisions on what is made uh, and how much goods are. China is very much a command economy. In China, they make what they make because the government tells them to make it. They are in control. Russia, the Soviet Union during the Cold War was a command economy. It's not anymore, but it was at the time. In countries where you have a command economy, you really don't have many choices because there's no incentive to have choices. So we've hosted foreign exchange students before uh, for brief times, not for the whole year. Uh, and ones that have come from a mixed or command economy just can't believe silly things like going to the grocery store and seeing how many cereals there are. If you go to the grocery store in a market economy, a country like the United States, you go down the cereal aisle, there's like 65 choices in a big grocery store of how many cereals you, you can choose from. And then there's like three varieties of Captain Crunch or three varieties of this thing or that thing. But in a command economy, you, you might only have three cereal choices, period, because there's no economic incentive to come up with this really clever idea of X, Y, or Z. Now, a mixed economy is where the government and the people make these decisions in a, in a mixed way. So it's a little bit command, a little bit market. Canada is a good example of a mixed economy. So in Canada, most businesses are run like a market. In other words, you come up with a good idea, you get rich. But the government there has decided that they are in charge of health care. So you don't get to make decisions about health care, uh, or, or at least business decisions about health care. It's provided to the people by the government. And so there are less choices, but everybody gets it. Um, so there's pluses and minuses, but it's a mixed economy. They have a little bit of both. And then traditional. Uh, what's a good example of a traditional economy? I think Chile uh, is a good traditional economy where many of the things they make, they make because they've always made them. So there's a lot of handcrafted items. All right, so those are the things we've covered already. So those are our economic basics. We just have a few more economic notes. So these are new notes. So you need to get out a pencil, pen, paper, and write these down so that you have them for worksheets or tests as we move forward. So we're going to talk a little bit about, so this is our first new topic today, how does the government regulate the economy and promote growth? Now, we're going to reinforce these ideas. And again, this is what this whole unit is about, is about basic ideas that don't really fit nicely into any of the other units, but they're themes that we're going to cover again and again. So how does the government regulate the economy and promote growth? And this is the same 150 years ago or yesterday. One of the ways is they put taxes on foreign goods, tariffs. A tax on a foreign good is called a tariff. And you do that in order to protect American business. So let me give you an example. A very common thing is for there to be a pretty high tariff on foreign cars. So the U.S. has a lot of really quality, good cars that you can buy. So anything like 
Ford, and Chevy are American car companies, okay? Honda and Toyota are foreign. Those are made in Japan. Uh, BMW is made in Germany. Um, Volkswagen is made in Germany. I, I'm for some reason blanking on other great examples. But in some of these countries, they don't pay their workers as much as we pay our workers. So this is the tricky part. When you go to buy a car, you're really tempted to buy the least expensive car that you think is going to be reliable. Well, if another country doesn't have a minimum wage or they pay their workers a lot less, that car is going to be a lot cheaper. But if everybody buys that cheaper car, Americans won't be able to keep their jobs making good cars too. So you put a tariff on that car. I happen to drive a Honda Civic. A Honda Civic is a very sort of just generic car. I mean, I like it. It's reliable, but there's nothing fancy about it. And Ford and Chevy make very, like, I think the Chevy Cruze is very similar, okay? It's a very similar car. If there wasn't a tariff on the Honda Civic, uh, on Honda, on those foreign car companies, the, the Civic might be half as much as it is right now. And that would make it a lot cheaper than the Chevy Cruze, and then nobody would buy the Chevy Cruze. If nobody buys the Chevy Cruze, all the people that work for Chevy would get laid off. I can't have that because you might say to yourself, well, that doesn't bother me. My parents or anybody I know, they don't work for the auto industry. But if it doesn't even have to be your, the people directly in your life. If you have a business in the United States, let's say your, your parents work for a restaurant. If you work in a restaurant, that restaurant will close if all the local businesses are losing money to foreign countries. You want Americans to have money in their pocket because if they've got money in their pockets, they're probably gonna be spending their money on something that will help you and your family, if that makes sense. So putting a higher tariff on a foreign product like a car, or really anything, but cars are a good example, that makes that car more affordable for you and makes you more likely to buy the American product. Now, if you don't have any American competition. And one industry that they always use on the air test is bananas. We cannot grow bananas in the United States, apparently. I, I guess there's these like weird types that aren't really good for people. They feed them to like animals. I guess there's a weird type they can grow in Florida. But for the most part, you cannot grow what we think of as, you know, typical bananas in the United States. So if we tax those, if we put a big tariff on those, the only person we're hurting is, is us. Uh, we're hurting the people that go to the grocery store and buy bananas. Now, it's true that by putting a tariff on cars, we end up making cars more expensive, but I see where we're helping people. We're helping people because we're letting, we're, we're letting Americans keep their jobs. But nobody in America is making their money making growing bananas. So when you have a, a product like that, where there is no American competition, you just lower that tariff, eliminate that tariff altogether. So that's one of the major ways you regulate the economy. The last way is through interest rates. Now this gets a little confusing and we're going to reinforce this in unit three and four um, and maybe even another unit beyond that in the future. But interest is what you charge to borrow money. Now this confuses some people uh, including my son uh, who's 22 and graduated from college and graduated with honors, but he still got confused. He didn't realize that because he borrowed $17,000 to go to college, uh, that he would have to pay more than $17,000 back. You see, the government, or, or anybody, the bank, whoever you might borrow money from, my, usually you borrow money from a bank. My son got a federal student loan, so he borrowed it kind of through the bank, through the government's, hmm, a government lending program. They charge interest. Only family doesn't charge you interest. Like, banks aren't in it to help you. Like, I don't want to like, be the person that bursts that bubble. But banks can't make any money if they just go, oh, you would like to borrow money? You seem nice. Here's some. No, 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 no. Banks lend you money because they want to make money off of you. So my son borrowed $17,000 and figured out that he has to pay $19,000 back. He's like, what? This is insane. Uh, he did a really good job. He graduated a year early. He had a whole bunch of scholarships. Uh, the college he went to was $25,000 a year, so to only borrow $17,000 was great, but he's blown away that he has to pay $19,000 back. Why? Well, the bank wants $2,000. The bank wants their interest. 
That's the money they charge to lend you money. Again, if you want to borrow $10,000 from the bank to buy a car, and by the way, the bank works with car dealerships, so you get to sign the bank loan right there at the car dealership. So when you borrow money from a car dealership, you're really borrowing it from a bank. They almost always charge you interest because they want to make money off of you that way too. Now, if you could talk your parents into letting you borrow $10,000 to buy a car, cool. They might not charge you interest, but that's because they're family. They love you. Your, your local bank, they may, you know, kind of like you, but they don't love you. So they're going to charge interest. The higher the interest rate, the more they're charging you to borrow money. Now that can be good for banks because if they make more money, they can lend more money. But most importantly, and again, I'm going to reinforce this over and over again, lower interest rates not only help you out because you pay less back, okay, they end up encouraging people to buy more items because if you go to buy something really big like a house or a car, which has a huge positive impact on the economy, you're far more likely to buy it if you don't have to pay as much interest because in your mind, it costs that much more and that's how you should look at it if you have to pay a lot of interest. So if you go to buy a car and that car is $20,000, but it's a high interest loan, you might have to pay $26,000 for that $20,000 car. But if you can get that for like 1% interest, you might only pay like 20500 or something like that for that $20,000 car. That's pretty reasonable. That's really low interest. So you'd be way more likely to buy it than if it costs you 26000 with interest. So when we lower interest rates, we make you more likely to buy the things that really, really everything, but the things that really help the economy, houses and cars. I know that's confusing. And that's why we're going to reinforce this, not just in this unit, but in multiple units. But people, banks charge you interest. Hey, family might charge you interest too. I don't know. That, that's between you and them. But banks charge interest because they want to make money off of you. They don't just care. My poor son, my oldest son was just so devastated to find out that strangers he'd never met don't really care about him. They want to make money off of him. That's the way the world works. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I do want to be the one to break that to you. So interest rates that are higher help banks make more money. Interest rates that are lower help save you money and make you more likely to buy things. These are all of our notes for this section. So that's it. Very few. In, in the future, you're going to be taking way more notes. But for the rest of today, I want you to notice the sort of to-do list in the Google Stream. Uh, this shouldn't have been long at all. And that was by design because I want you to do this formative review. And this is just a no stress review of some of the things we've done so far. And so this is as a separate thing. Uh, you'll click on it and there'll be a little form that you use to fill this out. And it's just going to ask you some questions, okay? And we're going to just kind of see where you are. But this is what we call a formative review. This means that I may be doing some sort of participation and I'll chart who does and doesn't do it. But if you do poorly on it, it cannot hurt you. This is practice. So that if everybody misses number one, the real purpose isn't to hurt your grade. It's for me to go, oh, I have to reteach that. They don't know that. So this, is, this just helps form how and what I teach. So you're going to have that assignment to do today. You also have an optional video an optional document that say, are you worried about passing? I'll have that posted today. Hey, some of you are already just crushing it. You know exactly what you're doing. If you're a little worried you're not doing things right, or you see already that your grade is not what you think it should or could be, click on those are you worried videos. It's only six minutes and that document, and it'll clarify what you need to do. And then, of course, the Friday Fun Day video. Uh, there are people who've won document of the week passes last week who still don't know they've won. You have to tell me, like you have to say, hey, Mr. Penrose, I want to use my document of the week pass that I've won, and one person in each class wins each week. And you want to tell me that you won that uh, and that you want to use that. Okay, so I've written down, here are the people with the passes. And then you tell me, hey, I want to use it this week. If you never tell me, then you just... It goes to waste. So you got to watch those Friday Fun Day videos. Besides this one, and I'm trying to film these in different places doing different things. This one, I'm on Lake Erie. So that's all I have for you today. I hope everybody has a great weekend. Next weekend, we are going to be, oh no, where's the record? There it is. Next weekend, we are going to be doing another document of the week, and this time it'll be from a news source. So I'll explain how to do that on Monday. Everybody have a great weekend. Don't forget to do the rest of the things on your list today.